Good evening. Welcome to the February 2021 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Um, we've got a really too full agenda, um, which I didn't expect initially for this evening. We likely will not get through all, well, we won't get through all of it, um, but we will do our best. Um, so let us begin with introductions quickly, sweetly, quietly. And I must atone for last month where I completely forgot my partner, both, I mean, like she didn't even exist. It was really humiliating. I will not live it down. So Captain Scribner, would you please go first and introduce yourself? Well, thank you, Aton. I appreciate that welcome there, my partner. Uh, I am Captain Julie Scribner with the Vermont State Police. I am the co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs with my partner, Aton. Thank you. I'm just going to go through my crazy screen like we all do. Pepper. Thank you. Uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Thank you. Judge Grierson. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Ryan Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Good to be, good to see everyone. Yes. Representative Grad. Mute. She is muted. It is true. But she is here. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was muted. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> Great. Again, um, Representative Maxine Grad, Chair of House Judiciary Committee, and um, thank you so much for, for inviting me tonight. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you for being thank here. Yeah. Monica. Monica, if you're speaking, you're muted. I think you're unmuted. My microphone wasn't plugged in. Can you hear me now? Uh -huh. <laughs> That's what happens when I move my equipment before a meeting. <laughs> Monica Weber, Administrative Services Director with the Department of Corrections. Thank you. And then I have guests, and I think it Judge, uh, I cannot remember your name. I, you're next, and you're muted, and yes. You're raising your hand. Could you please? Hi, Hi. I, Judge Davenport. Uh, Thank you. Amy retired Davenport. Judge, retired judge for a number of years now. No wonder you can't remember my name. I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, um, and mm -hmm. uh, I am a member of the Children and Family Council for Prevention Programs. Great. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Mayor. Is that me? That is you. Okay, Christopher Loris. I am a uh, research associate with Crime Research Group and also wear the hat of a newly minted member of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, where I'm happy to sit on the fair and impartial uh, committee with the good doctor. Thank you. Jen Firpo, please. Hi there, I'm Jen Firpo. I'm a training coordinator with the Vermont Police Academy. Right. Jeff Jones. Hi, Jeff Jones, uh, retired Vermont State Police, also on the uh, essays committee. Um, that's it. I'm here. Thank you. Sheila. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Uh, Sheila Linton, um, um, community at large, and with the Root Social Justice Center, she, her pronouns. Loretta Saki. Hi, I'm Loretta Saki. I'm a policy analyst with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Thank you. Thank you. Abigail Crocker, please. Hi, I'm Abby Crocker. I'm a, a research professor at, of statistics at the University of Vermont. 
um, part of the Justice Research Inif Initiative at UVM, and the National Center on Restorative Justice at the Vermont Law School. Great. Rebecca Turner. Hi, everyone. Uh, Rebecca Turner, head of the Appellate Division of the Office of the Defender General and panel member. Uh, Tyler. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director, uh, Department for Children and Families, Family Service Division. Uh, he, him pronouns. Great. And I love the way this all moves when you get going. Um, Olivia. Olivia Voth, please. Hi there, I'm Olivia. I'm a dean at the University of Vermont. I'm interning in the Attorney General's office, so I'll be taking the next. You're a little, Will, your audio's off. That's all. Just so you know. Sorry, um, I'm, I'm Olivia. Yeah. I'm a junior at the University of Vermont. Um, and I'm in, an intern with the Vermont Attorney General's office, so I'll be taking minutes tonight. Welcome, and thank, thank you. you. Jessica Brown, please. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Jessica Brown. She, her, I am the supervising attorney at the Chittenden County Public Defender Office in Burlington, and I'm an at-large appointee to the panel. Thanks. Elizabeth Morris. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Morris. I am the Juvenile Justice Coordinator, and I am in the Family Service Division of the Department for Children and Families. Great. Susanna Davis, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. David Scherer. Hi, everybody. David Scherer, Assistant Attorney General and Attorney General's designee to the panel. Thank you. Karen Gannett. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Gannett, the Executive Director of Crime Research Group, and I'm happy to be here with you. Great. And Julio, who's sitting in the middle of a hopper painting. <laughs> I'm Julio Thompson. Um, I'm an Assistant Attorney General, Director of the Civil Rights Unit. And then I have a plus four that I can't reach. If I have not called you, please chime in in some decent way. Hi, everyone. I, oh, hi, Etan. It's Sarah Friedman with the Council of State uh, Governments Justice Center here as a guest. Thank you. Uh, Aton, it's Martin Lalonde, uh, representative on the Judiciary Committee. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, representative. Thank you. That might be two others left. Because. Or maybe not. Oh, I'm getting. Oh, I see. All right. I just got some technical assistance from my dear partner, Jeffrey Pippinger. Are you here? No. I'm not sure. Well, we're going to just assume that's everyone. Welcome. Um, again, we have a fairly full agenda this evening. Oh, I'm Aton Nasred and Longo. Forgot that. Chair of the panel. Moving on. Fairly full agenda this evening. I would like to begin with approval of the minutes from our meeting on 12 January. Uh, and of course, amendments, changes, so on and so forth. Please hold forth or make a motion. Uh, James Pepper, I move that we approve the minutes. So moved. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Is there any discussion? I'm assuming not. 
Um, I'd just like to bring up, I don't have discussion, but I didn't receive the minutes. I might have dropped off the uh, the the list. Uh, throwing that out there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you're always the problem, child. I will make sure they come to you. <laughs> I am Thank sorry. You, that would be on me. No, I'm okay. sorry. I will make sure. Then let's vote. All in favor of approving the minutes as submitted, please signify by saying aye. 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 Or raising their hand, as Rebecca did. All opposed. Okay, and all abstaining. And all abstaining. What? I'll, I'll abstain out of decorum. <laughs> Got Although it. I, I trust that they are in order. <laughs> Jen, do you have a question? No. No, sir. I'm standing aside because I was not at the last meeting. Got it. Minutes are approved as submitted. Thank you. Um, Chief Stevens, would you like to introduce yourself? You're muted. Hi, I'm Chief Stevens uh, from the Nolhegan Abenaki tribe. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. It's okay. Good to see you. All right. So we've approved the minutes. Now we move on to announcements. Does anyone, I, there are several, but there are probably others that I did not get Window, does anyone have anything? Suzanne, uh, you're not quite there, Suzanne. I know you. Well, I, you're, you're on the list, but there are going to be a couple that I think are going to happen before you. Um, having seen nothing else, um, David, would you like to introduce our assistant? Sure. Um, uh, she introduced herself a moment ago, but she is Eliz Olivia Voth, and she will be taking minutes. She is an intern in our office this semester. She's working, doing a lot of legislative work, actually, uh, and she produces excellent written products, which we are very grateful for. So uh, I'm sure she'll do the same for all of us tonight, and, um, and uh, we welcome her, and, and thanks, everybody, for welcoming her. And David, you're actually up also regarding stipends. Yes, so uh, wanted to remind everybody, well, not everybody actually, wanted to remind a few people who are community representatives to the panel. Uh, in other words, if you are a panel member who is not a state employee and not for some reason receiving a somebody else isn't for some reason paying you to be here, which I, I don't expect um, anybody falls into that category if you're not a state employee. Um, you are entitled to per diems. Uh, I realize, I think there's been some, uh, 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 maybe confusion, maybe not, but there hasn't been per diem reimbursement requests for quite a long time, I think because nobody is traveling to the meetings. However, under the statutes, uh, the governing statutes, you are still entitled to the $50 per meeting stipend, um, fee, compensation, stipend, whatever you want to call it. So you can still claim reimbursements for those. And we and I will send out an email to the community members with a uh, Excel spreadsheet, which will hopefully look familiar to you from back in the days when uh, you were filling them out more often. Um, a reminder that you do not need to put your social security number back on that document. Uh, if you've already filled one out, we already have that and no need to uh, have that number out in more digital places. Um, so I'll get that out either later tonight or first thing in the morning. And please send that back to me. If you have any questions about your individual situation, how many meetings it's been, things like that, just email me directly and we'll get it figured out. Thank you, David. Any discussion? Any questions? Okay. Short and sweet. Thank you, David. Now, on to what is actually written on the agenda. An inquiry from the Racial Equity Task Force from Susanna Davis, the Executive Director of Racial Equity. Susanna, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. I'm going to try to keep with the theme of short and sweet by um, relaying the following. So as many of you know, the Racial Equity Task Force was created by the governor last summer by an executive order. And in that executive order, the task force was um, directed to examine three main things. The first being systems of support for communities of color in Vermont generally, but also especially as it relates to COVID-19 disparities. The second item is uh, free speech and hate speech and any possible changes to state law that can be made to strengthen uh, protections against hate speech. And the third item, is, which and he explicitly named um, displays of hate symbols, including Confederate flags. And the third item was how strategies and recommendations to get more people of color to serve in public office at all levels in the state, including boards and commissions. So the two reports that we generated, one was in September, one was uh, just posted last week. I am sharing those in the chat right now, along with the um, racial equity director report that was issued in January. And the reason that I'm talking about all of this to you is because the racial equity task force through the completion of its second report has now completed the items that we were explicitly asked to do by the governor in that executive order. But there were a number of items that we deliberately did not cover because we thought that they deserved deeper and more thoughtful consideration, namely uh, policing and criminal justice. And um, and there was just a lot around you know, schools and, and some other things that we didn't quite touch. And that explanation is more fleshed out in the introductory language of both reports, if you're interested. Um, but what we did decide is that now that we're done with what we have been asked to do, there appears to be more work that the task force would like to complete. They'd like to revisit the topic of criminal justice and policing. And, um, and because the RDAP is a thing that exists in the world, we felt very strongly that any work that we do on that topic should absolutely be done in coordination with, um, or another way to phrase that nicely, um, with this panel. So I come to you all to, um, to let you know that the task force is considering taking up this topic, but we also recognize that it is very much your lane. And we would like to explore some of the topics that are creating disparities for people of color, but we don't wanna duplicate efforts and we don't wanna step on toes. So um, I'm here to ask a question to which I don't need an answer now, but the question is, uh, the questions are, is this committee um, interested in that kind of collaboration? Is there work that this committee has not had the time to cover that perhaps we could begin with? Or um, what do you all see as the best way for us to approach any kind of collaboration or to approach the work in general? Uh, again, I think a number of you know me and I'm very much about bringing the committees together and not duplicating work because, honestly. Um, but I also very much want to defer to the will of the task force as much as possible. And so um, I go where they, they tell me to go and that brought me here. So thank you all. Again, I don't need answers on any of that tonight, but um, perhaps you will peruse the reports the last two pages of each of those reports contains the summarized recommendations. Um, and if any of that is interesting to you, or if you think that there is opportunity for that work, then you know where to find me. Thank you all. Thank you. My recommendation would be that people peruse the report and we can handle a lot of this through email. Um, that I can certainly send out email um, asking those questions again. Chief Stevens. Uh, hi, Exana. How are you? Um, nice seeing you. Uh, question about hate speech. Does that include um, the cyber world? Um, I know David and the AG created, um, you know, uh, the cyber bullying and cyber uh, hate speech kind of thing that if there was problems, we could go to them and and uh, report it. The, the, I, I asked that specifically and also if your agency or either the AG will help um, request that some of these things be shut down. Where we run into our problem against Native people, there's a lot of hate um, rhetoric 
uh, on blog sites and other types of things, but they get around it by by operating outside of Vermont. But since it touches Vermont, I didn't know if there's ways to request that those hosted sites bring them down because they affect people within the state or not. Because now that a lot of um, things that happened around the presidential election where people are taking down um, hate um, sites and hate blogs, I didn't know if that's something that could happen or is it outside the jurisdiction just because they're operating outside the state? Does that make sense? It does make a lot of sense and I'm about to massively disappoint you and everybody in the room <laughs> by saying that um, the conclusion to which we came in the report, and this is report number two specifically, is that because of all of the constitutional entanglements, there's very little that we actually can do at the state level on, on hate speech. Um, and there are some things that we could try, but we know that we would um, face legal challenges. And that's not to say that we shouldn't try anyway, um, but that there's there's options, but that there, there's no guarantees to those options. So um, what we ended up deciding was, we think that certain things would be beneficial to society, like blanket bans on hate symbols, like, um, you know, perhaps um, closer monitoring of rhetoric, um, and I mean, we talked about things like potentially changing the definition under state law of what constitutes harassment to include things like displays of Confederate flags, um, given that today that flag means something a little bit different than it did even, you know, six years ago. So, and at the end of the day, um, we ended up arriving at the conclusion that probably none of that is legal. So, um, so we're just going to go with propaganda and just propagandize people to not be hateful, which is hard and it feels um, really unsatisfactory. That's that's where we are right now. And, and also to the point specifically about social media, I know that this is a big conversation in law enforcement, especially um, because it's one of the areas where we think background matters for police officers. Um, and yet we also butt up against some of those constitutional issues too. So. I don't know that there's a clean answer to any of it, but I don't want you to think that we're not thinking about it. I think it's just a matter of how do we do this in a way that doesn't curtail people's federal, you know, constitutional rights, um, but that actually can move the needle. So I'm sorry for the unsatisfactory answer. No, that's okay. Thank you very much. Pepper. Hey, Susanna. Good to see you. Um, I actually, I did read the report um, and it's, Fantastic, great, it's really great work. Um, I have more of an administrative question for you, which is um, especially for our public members. Um, uh, when when do you all meet? Is it during business hours or is it after hours? And do you have the similar kind of ability to reimburse, uh, particularly our public members, for you know kind of bringing these two groups together, which I would ent imagine entails uh, more time um, and more uh, more meetings? Yeah, that's a great, those are great questions. We meet, uh, we've changed our meeting schedule when we're close to or far from a deadline. So um, at our height, we were meeting uh, twice a week for an hour, Mondays and Wednesdays. Right now we are meeting every two weeks on Mondays and who knows what it'll be uh, by the next time. So our next meeting is actually this Monday, which is the 15th. 15th. Thank you. 4 to 5 p.m. We do, um, members are eligible for the per diems under that per diem statute. And, um, and I think that one thing that might work, and again, we're talking about a lot of schedules to, to coordinate, but um, theoretically, if we were to have like joint meetings or something, I think uh, the, the task force is probably smaller than this group. And I think we would be more than happy to perhaps shift one of our meetings so that everybody could just show up on the same day and not create bigger volume of meetings. Um, yeah. Great, or, or thank something. you. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I know that that was actually one of your recommendations about kind of making these meetings more accessible for uh, members of the, the public, the non-state non employees, yeah. So Susanna, you don't need an answer right now. You want, I, I, I would 
because I'm trying to figure out what we should do. In other words, should we put this on the agenda for March and try to get the Racial Equity Task Force to this meeting? I don't need an answer now. Um, it would be nice to have a sense of where the, the panel is at for, for our meeting on Monday, but I don't want to rush you because you have a process and I want to respect that. So um, however you all feel you need to deliberate is, is fine by us, but we just wanted to make sure that you all knew that our attention seems to be turning toward justice and we just want to make sure that um, you know that that we're we're not treading on well settled territory without letting letting folks know and and seeking counsel assistance and guidance where where possible. So yeah, I don't I don't need an answer right now, um, but you should just kind of at least know that that's our thinking. Okay. Okay. Hey, hey Tom, could you send those reports to us uh, so we don't have to try to download them from chat the email? If you would please. Uh, I will. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I I will. I hey, John, will. Is, it, is it useful if I send that over just to reply to your email that you sent to the group? Sure. I will do that now. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. We will do. And I'll get that out and we'll go from there. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, um, on to discussion. There is an there's an addition that came in this afternoon because your chair is a little scattered and pulling these agenda together is not always the easiest thing to do. What I'd like to begin with is a bit of a report on outstanding research for Act 148 that Karen Gannett of the Crime Research Group will give us. Um, you will remember from Section 19 of that act that there were other things we were directed to do. Um, and one of them, I mean, Pepper continually reminds me of this, um, as does the Sentencing Commission as a general group, um, that we were also supposed to really identify bits of data that do exist and make recommendations on them. We were a bit overwhelmed as a group by how much didn't exist and how much couldn't talk to each other, the data systems. And that's where we focus most of our energy. However, there do seem to be some things that can be done. And so Karen Gannett will now address um, what we're calling outstanding research for Act 148, specifically Section 19. Karen? Thanks, Eitan. Um, I think you, you said, I think you pretty much said it. So to further the work um, under Section 19 of Act 148 is um, a suggestion, and it's, and it's pretty convoluted in that first paragraph, but that there would be an analysis of sentencing patterns looking at racial and geographic disparities. So um, in consultation with you all and with the Sentencing Commission, we're gonna take that on and take a look at sentencing patterns by county, race, and gender. And so we'll get started on that. And as we start to um, work through some of the information and, and pull down the sentences, um, we'll report back to you on how things are going. We'll report back to both you and the Sentencing Commission on how things are going. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. Okay. Rebecca. Hi, Karen, thanks for that intro. And I, of course, am with you on Sentencing Commission as well. Um, but uh, so I appreciate you and I think I've seen some of this work in the Sentencing Commission context. But when you say that you are going to be looking into and providing for us um, some of this missing data relating to sentencing patterns, can you go into a little more detail as to what type of sentencing data? Maybe you don't have this information right now, but to provide, like, is it what was, because you know, we just did this data report and in terms of all the points related to sentencing, there's sort of the request, um, right? There's the max, the minimax possible by statute. There is yeah. the request or, uh, you know, what the prosecutor is asking for. What is, what is the 
plea agreement, what is the actual ones imposed by the judge, then there's the sentence imposed on the date of sentencing, and then who is still in, right? Who gets out at min, who gets out at max? And so we know that, well, some of us know, uh, you know, I don't want to presume there's so much nuance there in terms of when we say sentencing. I just wondered if you could clarify now or later how you're approaching that. Yeah, um, I can give you a brief idea of what we'll be looking at. So we can get um, from the court data all the sentences that have been imposed. So whether it's a deferred, whether it's a split sentence, whether it's an incarcerative sentence, and whether it's a probation sentence. And we can take a look at all the offenses, all the types of offenses. And Robin can take a look back. I don't know how far she's planning on going, but can take a look back over um, several years and break that down by county, break that down by race, and break that down by gender. We will not get nuances um, because I don't think that's always available in the court data, but I can certainly have her come up with a list of data elements that she's going to be able to look at and get that out to everybody if, if you're interested, and certainly get that out to you, Rebecca. Karen, Karen. No, sorry. Could I do a follow-up question, Aton? Yeah, sure. So sentencing in the context of adult criminal convictions, um, did you or and are we, Pepper, does, does Act 148, the details, require us to provide the same analysis for delinquencies? And I know we're not, I mean, it's different. It's different in terms of sentencing imposed because it's delinquencies, but is there anything similar? I don't think there is. I just wanted to get clarification. Pepper? I, I just pulled up Act 148. Oh, sorry. And uh, I don't think it mentions anything about delinquencies or dispositions uh, in juvenile cases. <clears throat> but I think that, that uh, to the extent that CRG can get that data, it would be helpful. I know it's difficult because it's mostly confidential, but um, <clears throat> maybe they could work with DCF. I'm not sure, but uh, I don't see anything in here that would uh, apply specifically to the juvenile system. I can I can see what Robin can do. I think one of the issues with the juvenile system is that many of those cases get expunged um, within a certain period of time. But I'll take I'll ask her what she can do around the juvenile sentences. We do get um, we do get um, juvenile data. Karen, this is Rebecca again. I think too, uh, and Judge Grierson and Judge Davenport are here too, or yeah. DCF, they might have some useful data on that front as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, Chief Stevens. Yeah, I just, I have a quick thing, um, Eitan, about uh, when we, we were surprised about how much the uh, systems didn't talk to each other. Uh, I just want to make a note and don't know if there's a way for all of uh, the state agencies we work with to advocate. It looked like um, in Vermont Digger that uh, the governor is looking to infuse like millions of dollars into the IT uh, realm for privacy. Maybe there's an opportunity to um, use some one-time funds from to be able to maybe have some of these systems. If they're looking at uh, maybe consolidating or reorganizing, and it's not just hardware. Maybe there's an opportunity to advocate for what we might need and slip it in um, because we knew it was going to cost a lot of money anyway. But maybe maybe uh, people can keep that on their radar. I mean, it, it may be outside of what we're talking about, but it but maybe there's an opportunity to look at where we can maybe um, kind of get some of the things that we recommended. Anyway, just a just a side note. I saw it today that that he was really interested in fusing a lot of money. Uh, I think it was like 1.6 million or something like that. I don't remember, but it was a, a significant amount of money. Olivia, please, if you could make a note of that, so I'll remember to do something with that. Thank you, well, Sheila. I think um, I had a question for Karen. I wanted, um, she said that we do receive some um, youth data. Could you be more explicit of what you mean by that? And I also had a question around that of whether 
you, when you charge youth as adults, if that happens, and if that's part of the data that you might be speaking about? Um, we receive data from the courts and it's on juvenile cases. We don't receive names of juveniles. We receive them. Um, and so Robin can do research on that data. And I don't know, we don't use the juvenile data a whole lot. We don't work with it a whole lot. So I'd really have to um, get with her and find out what actual data field she gets. Um, and I can do that and let you know. And I, I did want to say in response to the chief that um, there is another piece to the the date the information sharing work that I think needs to be done. That this is something that um, came new to me when I when I was working on another project. And I, I just want to throw it out there for you all to maybe think about um, when we're talking about data systems working with each other there's a certain amount of work that has to go on kind of behind the scenes and it has to do with data governance and and making sure that there are agreements between um, departments and organizations so you know what data and you guys have have listed the data out that you'd like to see but all those organizations that keep the data have to have some sense of um, agreements as to who's going to get the data, who's going to share the data, where's the, where are the data, where are they going to go um, so that other people can access them for research or to answer the questions you have. So there's data governance, there are data requirements, which are really around what, um, what data are we talking about, what questions do you want answered, and then there's the actual data architecture, which is the technology system behind being able to do some of that, and the process to get the data to where it needs to go to be useful. And so I just want to throw that out there because being people who want data, um, and I certainly am one of those people, um, so that we can do our research. There's a whole nother piece of work that is, that is, I think, critical to this, that we tend to, I certainly have tended to not be aware of. And I just wanted to share that with you. And maybe that's um, something at some point this, this group might want to take a look at and talk about, because it's a, I think it's an important piece when it comes to different departments sharing data with each other. Okay. Thank you, Karen. I feel an addendum to our report coming on after you get this done, Karen. Sure. Yeah, I feel like that needs to go to the legislature. I, I mean, it was required by the act, so I think our work may not be, it won't be as long, but I think we will probably have to do that. Normally, when I feel the need for that, I just lie down until the feeling passes. But <laughs> I think we're required. So thank you for outlining that. Um, any other questions or comments? Eitan, I would just, as because my name was mentioned prior, it, I think it would have been very difficult for this group, particularly to meet the deadline requirements of analyzing all sentencing patterns using the existing data across the state. So I, I it, it, you know, even though I reminded you of it, it's it's only in in the sense that, you know, given the three or two months that we had to do it, I don't know if it was it was possible. You know? No, I I understand that, Pepper. I'm just trying to cross. <laughs> T's, dot I's, things right. like that. But thank you. No. Anybody else have a have comments or questions or material? Okay. Moving on. This is me. An update concerning our recent report submitted on 1 December. Um, I just want to fill you in in the interests of transparency about what's going on with that. Um, and this leads into a larger arc for the meeting, actually. Um, I've been presenting and re-presenting this report, and I certainly have wanted to inform you, but there just really hasn't been time 
As you know, when the session is underway, invitations frequently come late in the game. Um, and it's difficult to figure out how to tell people when I get an invitation at perhaps three in the afternoon about something happening in the following morning. So I didn't want you to think I was just doing this behind your back. That certainly has not been my intention. And I do feel badly about it, but life is what it is. As you know, last month, um, I let you know that I had spoken with the Joint Judicial uh, Justice Oversight Committee, Senator Sears Committee, um, with Rebecca Turner, and that was the first presentation. And at that meeting, Senator Sears directed, um, I guess, Legislative Counsel, Bryn Hare, to begin drafting related legislation based on the report. Also met with the House Government Operations Committee, um, which is uh, what? Senator White's committee. Yes, she is the chair. David, am I wrong on that? David, you always That's know. right. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, of course, House Judiciary with Representative Grad, who's with us this evening. Um, also spoke with the Council of State Governments Justice Reinvestment to Working Group, and most recently with a joint meeting of the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. Um, and then, of oh, right, and then there was a discussion of the report with the Sentencing Commission on, I think it was the 25th of January. Um, I don't remember exactly. There's n uh, Anyway, I've been running around doing this. It's, it's, it, I, I'm like, I got it memorized now, pretty much. Um, there's not a whole lot to relate here in some ways. Um, as a result of these presentations and re-presentations, two main concerns have come out, as you can imagine, and I'm sure you can guess them before I send, say them. The first is, of course, how to pay for what we've recommended. Um, and we knew that would be an issue. Um, I made an argument about that that I think has been somewhat persuasive. Secondly, a question has been where to house this body. Uh, and then lastly, the specifics of its constitution. In other words, are three people really actually needed or is there some flow around that? Um, there has also been some very big interest in having the Connecticut officials with whom the subcommittee met back in November, November 3rd that was, speak to the legislature. But I spoke with Sarah Friedman of the Council of State Governments and she's here with us this evening. And in essence, and Sarah, I'm going to just sort of encapsulate this. If I get something wrong, this is your moment to shine. Um, in essence, her response was that the Connecticut situation does not completely translate here in Vermont. The Connecticut people, um, their data collection is not simply about racial disparity. It's broader than that. Thus, Given these other concerns, a very different funding mechanism is involved since this other work is concerned. Um, so did I get that right, Sarah? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I might add some detail if you don't mind, Aton. Go for it. Yeah, so so the Connecticut folks that spoke to the, um, who spoke to the subcommittee, uh, the, the Criminal Justice Policy and Planning Division, um, they're both the state's uh, state administering agency and statistical analysis center. So they do data, data, connect data across all criminal justice, all the agencies in the state on a variety of different research topics, including things like, you know, doing corrections projections. I think we actually had a conversation about that in the in the subcommittee um, and kind of more broadly than just racial disparities. Um, and then they also have a whole other like section of um, what they do around uh, federal grant administration. And so when um, Aton asked me to research, you know, well, how much does Connecticut spend on this? Um, uh, you know, uh, in in doing research on that and, and speaking to Mark Pelka about it, it's just there wasn't really a one to one model that Vermont could use because they're kind of were embedded in a larger agency that already had all of its infrastructure up and running. Um, and their and really their mission and their overall um, uh, their overall work is much more broad than what Vermont um, is 
uh, is proposing. So just that in terms of funding me mechanisms or there isn't like a you can't pick up and say, oh, well, Connecticut costs X amount of money. So Vermont should invest X amount of money in it. It, it looks a little different. And and I, I think within that also is, is recognizing that what Vermont is proposing is actually pretty unique in a way that's that's really um that's really amazing and and that although Connecticut can be a an interesting model and there are p pieces of it that you all are definitely emulating you're doing your own thing in kind of a first in the country way um in something that in in a way that you all should be really proud of and kind of also you know like yes we're doing like kind of taking some of the best practices from Connecticut but we're also doing something unique and really really cool frankly okay thank you for filling that in, I wouldn't have gotten all that. <laughs> anyway, so there we have it. What we're doing is frankly unprecedented. And so we're a bit in terra incognita or unknown land, as it were. Um, again, the details are concerning as they should be to the legislature. Questions have come up again, are three people really needed? There has also been some interest in working with other bodies in collaboration. And so there have been questions as to how the Crime Research Group and also the National Center for Restorative Justice um, could interface with this work. You'll remember we met with them um, in the fall and they made a statement which became Appendix 5 of our report on page 25, if you all have that open. Um, those had questions about all of this sort of collaboration have been raised both within and notably also without legislative meetings. Um, collaboration, of course, between various research bodies would have implications both for housing, what is being called the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, and of course, for funding. Um, the important point here, I think, is that the recommendations that we made in the recent report are indeed being taken quite seriously and are resulting in what will be the next agenda item, which is a draft of an act relating to establishing a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics and a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. Um, and we'll be looking at that this evening and commenting upon it. This is what I've, we've just done in brief, what's happened during the last six weeks or so around the report that we completed and submitted on the 1st of December. It's been a rather busy and consuming time, as you can imagine. Anyway, I just wanted to put that in front of you all as a sort of synopsis of what's gone on. Um, this is a good moment for questions, any additions, any corrections, concerns, um, this would be a good time to put that out there. As I say, I don't always have time to like let you know that something is happening. I have to just kind of go with it. Okay. I am Chief Stevens. Hey, Tom, I hate to keep jumping in, but I, um, I've seen this happening with state government a lot is that they want to create all these commission and boards and have just per, per diem, uh, um, you know, allocations. I think at some point they seriously got to think of full-time positions to work on some of these things because there's only so many people that can volunteer their time to do uh, per diem work. I mean, you see a lot of the same faces on the same commissions and committees. And I I'm just saying is at some point, instead of just creating commissions with per diem, they should look at actually putting some meat in the game and 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 putting full time positions that could actually work seriously on on these things full time. Uh, it's just a comment, but you see this happening a lot with creating boards and commissions that they're basically almost volunteer with with just very little bit of stipend and and um, I, I think they really need to start putting some skin in the game with some of these things. Um, Anyway, it's just a comment that we, anyway, it is what it no, is. No, it's great. And it, I'm glad it's a comment because it will go in the record. It will go in the minutes. Thank you. Um, Professor Crocker. Um, 
Thank you. And and I, I just wanted to comment on um, your note about collaboration with existing entities. Um, so I sort of sit at that intersection of, of UVM um, as well as the Vermont Law School's National Center on Restorative Justice and have been so impressed by all the work that's going on with this group. Um, and I know that folks in both of those entities are interested in engaging more in conversation because um, a lot of that infrastructure that, that Karen mentioned earlier about secure data systems, data governance policies, data architecture, um, data management and negotiating sort of contracts and agreements. A lot of that infrastructure exists at, right now um, within the university. Um, and, and I know there's interest in, you know, sort of how can we how can we leverage all these great partnerships to make the most for everybody um, and create that system? So there, there's definitely maybe an opportunity to leverage existing resources um, with, with this opportunity. So I just wanted to put that out there um, for folks to think about. Great, thank you. Anybody else on this? On my, the summary of the last six weeks? Okay, moving right along. And this is, I want to introduce this and then it really is gonna, it's the panel. Everybody I'm hoping has had a chance to read the draft of an act relating to establishing a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, excuse me, and a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. I don't know why I can't say that word tonight, but it's not happening. Anyway, I did send that out to you as an attachment, and I do desperately hope, dearly hope, that you have all had a chance to take a look at it. Um, the background. Eric Fitzpatrick is an attorney for the Vermont Senate and House Judiciary Committees with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, he reached out to me um, just before I met with um, the House and Senate um, Judiciary Committees uh, with the intention of starting to draft the legislation that you see in front of you or somewhere near you at the moment. Um, he has been working on this and submitted the draft of that legislation for uh, to us for our consideration. And as I say, I've passed it on to you. We've been in contact about several issues during the drafting. First, where these bodies should be housed. And secondly, the matter of the advisory body that would advise this Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. In terms of housing, there seem to be three options. First, in the office of the Executive Director of Racial Equity, of, that would be, of course, under Susanna Davis's purview. Um, secondly, in the Agency of Digital Services, or three, as a standalone body. Um, those, uh, the call from him was rather difficult for me because in those calls, of course, I represent you all, it's not about me, and there's no way to get your feedback in the middle of a phone call, so I did the best I could. Um, I thought of the Executive Director of Racial Equity for reasons that I assume are obvious, and then I called Director Davis to get her feedback on this idea. Um, you should know that I said a lot to the legislature about how more staff would be needed and that just throwing more work to that sadly understaffed office was not going to be acceptable to many folks on this panel and certainly not to me personally as a person of color. Um, so in the end, the draft that you have has all of this going to the office of the executive director of racial equity. Um, we also discussed the advisory body and that was an interesting conversation we discussed the, what might be called somewhat terrifying proliferation of racial equity work groups. Um, indeed, Susanna Davis and Chief Stevens have kind of talked about that this evening um, in different ways. Um, and that is an issue which 
um, Director Davis has been addressing along with members of the various work groups that have come about really in the last few decades, but most dramatically in what, perhaps the last eight years or so. Um, Mr. Fitzpatrick was sensitive to this and was wondering whether the RDAP, in other words, us, could serve itself as that body. The recommendation in the report is as follows, um, that this body's work, meaning the, this advisory body that we proposed, should be guided by an advisory organ consisting of stakeholders from historically impacted communities, such as BIPOC communities, neurodivergent communities, and communities of gender and sexual minorities that concerns itself with the definition, collection, and analysis of data pertaining to the amelioration of racial disparities in the juvenile and adult criminal justice systems. Stakeholder input on these matters is crucial, unquote. So those are two matters that immediately need our attention and about which I'd like to get back to Mr. Fitzpatrick as soon as possible after our meeting tonight, because this is, again, as it says in the watermark, a draft. Everything else is obviously open because this meeting tonight is our chance as a full panel to weigh in on this legislation as it is being created. So now I am going to shut up and hope that you all have some absolutely wonderful ideas. Yeah. Pepper, I see you thinking. I am thinking. Okay. I'm hoping everyone had time to read this. Because basically what it does, for those of you who may not have, is it goes through the data points that we suggested very carefully that he makes a really good effort at saying these data are what need to be collected. It, all, it, it codifies it really quite dramatically, in my opinion. Eitan, um, could you, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to even ask you, I, it's embarrassing, but could you just summarize the two decision points that you'd like us to be discussing just very briefly, sure. kind of like an instant replay in, in football? <laughs> just uh, I can. Um, one would be. Where to house this, is that it? Correct. That's first. And the second would be the advisory body that we proposed that would help these three poor individuals who are going to make that beautiful drawing on page 24 of our report make some kind of sense to a human being, yep. that that advisory body not be a brand new body, but in fact be this panel as it presently is constituted or as it might be in another year or whatever but you get the idea well so on the on the first point um you know one of our recommendations was to try and offer this body uh some sort of independence um from kind of the i forget the phrase that we use but the essentially just separated from the political vagaries of the, yeah. um, um, and if it was with, uh, the director of racial equity, the executive director of racial equity, um, I'd be curious to know, uh, just cause I know she's on the call right now, how, how she feels about being housed within the, um, what is she, a cabinet position? Um, how she feels being uh, kind of housed within the office of the governor. And whether you, you feel that you um, are kind of, you know, not 
controlled by kind of the politics of the moment kind of. Yeah, um, it is a very uh, ambiguous spot. I don't think anybody quite knows where to put me. And to some extent, I kind of like that because eventually we're going to do something bold on racial equity and they're going to say, can she do that? And I'm going to say, well, prove that I can't. But um, for now, the way that it sits is that it's uh, the role is housed within the agency of administration. So technically it is under Suzanne Young, uh, but it is also considered a cabinet level position. So it also technically reports directly to the governor. Um, but more often I, I interact with Suzanne Young and with the deputy chief of staff in the governor's office. Um, I, I am aware that when the role was first created, there was a lot of back and forth about its independence and about making it independent of the governor's office. And it ended up not being that. And um, there are enough people in the state who have opinions on that, that I'm not going to share one tonight. Um, I will say that I have, I have experienced really good um, collaboration from the governor's office, but I will also say that um, really, really, really hard challenges and really, 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 really strong disagreements haven't happened yet. So it's unclear how that will go when that does happen. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to stray too much from the point of, of your question. So I'll, I'll leave sure. you there. Thank you. That is helpful. Chief it's Stephen. My, oh, now, Pepper, you're still going. No, Go I'm not. No, I, I mean, I have another thought, but I, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to disrupt the flow of the conversation. Okay, hold on to that, Chief Stevens. I I just want to ask, uh, Zana. One, would you even want that um, responsibility for one and? And B, um, what are the pros and cons? Because we did, we we focused a lot on the Human Rights Commission, and that's where that those three positions came from, is because they are somewhat independent. Um, remember that we when we first talked about this, and we had uh, a testimony that came in. We said, how many people would you need to take the complaints and follow through with some of the statistics? And that's she's the one that recommended they would need three positions. I believe that's where all that came from. But what are the pros and cons from having it housed in the Human Rights Commission compared to what you're doing, Exana? Uh, and also, uh, on the second point, I think there's a lot of talented people on this board uh, who, who uh, for the, the Attorney General Racial Disparities, uh, to be able to provide that kind of insight on on the data points that they're looking for but i'm just concerned about the time commitment it would take for a volunteer board to try to crunch this number even even pepper said to try to go through all that in three months was probably impossible and this is going to be a full-time thing right this isn't just a one-off so uh, i i think we have the expertise i'm not sure we have the time unless they do something different so those were the two comments I wanted to make and ask uh, if you were up for the up for this or if you, you know, uh, or if it should go to the Human Rights Commission, as we had discussed it a while back. Thank you. Steve, the one thing I, I, I think you, you're laboring under a bit of a misapprehension. The the question around the Human Rights Commission, that was the report of a year before. That was the 2019 report. It's just happenstance that it's three and three, that they were, we recommended three people for that and that there's three people for this particular proposed bureau. They weren't connected. Okay. I, I was, I was thinking about because we were trying to, we were trying to house uh, data collection and, um, and recommendation around the human rights commission because they were often the first point of contact and then they were they were having trouble following up and they needed data points and i could be incorrect but i just remember the director coming in or or, or the former director came coming in and testifying that that's some of the information they would need in order to carry out that data collection and follow-up so if i'm mistaken i'm sorry but um that's what i thought we we're talking about data collection and, and data statistics so i thought that it was one and the same right now yeah. But thank you. Jeff? 
Uh, just briefly, um, more and more I come to the position that uh, data in many cases is the energy that drives this particular machine we call RDAP. If Ms. Davis declines the wonderful opportunity to have even more work to do, um, I submit that possibly a part-time or full-time paid position reporting directly to this panel to look at, which would require no additional time from the chair who are totally overburdened, that would report to you with copies to all of us may be beneficial. Um, that's an end around, but that's what comes to mind. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that's in the minutes. Um, Sheila, I, yes, I, I had I had seen your hand and then I saw it go away. <laughs> um, thanks, Aton. I just I, I also had the question that um, Chief Dunn Stevens had too for Susanna, which is around what are the really the pros? Um, wanting to actually hear that question answered of what would be the pros of having it in her branch and what are what are the cons to that? And I also, depending on sort of what is being said with that, I I'm leaning towards it being more of an independent because we've talked about on numerous occasions, I agree with Jeff that data is driving these conversations and I feel like they often have, and I've expressed my concerns around specifically having data-driven conversations within this panel and within this body of work, understanding why it's needed. But there are many things that we've talked about on this panel that is not just inclusive of data. We've talked about oversight, we've talked about accountability, and we've talked about other things that are also things that we've talked about having an independent um, source to be able to do those things. So why not create something that is independent when there are so many things that we're trying to address to where we would like to get it out of the bureaucracy, get it out of the um, sort of the um, powers that be, the political scene, all of those things. Um, I kind of question why wouldn't we want to be um, putting it in an independent um, place? Thank you. Zuzana, do you want to talk about? OK. Yes, so the short answer is on pros and cons. I would say the main pro to having it in AOA slash Office of Racial Equity, which is in a real office. People say office, but they just mean me. But I let them because, you know. Um, <laughs> it sounds very the, grand. Right. Um, in this office, we always wear SpongeBob pajamas. Um, so the the pro is centrality. Um, you know, having the work kind of because this role is supposed to oversee the statewide collection of race data that's explicitly stated in Act Nine of 2018 that created the role. So um, overseeing the statewide collection of race data, of course, is easier when that collection is happening through this office. So having a central place is the pro. The con is that it, uh, I guess, I don't know how to, how to phrase it, but um, it's an odd fit for the agency of administration specifically because it's not topically relevant to the other functions that AOA performs. Uh, AOA performs functions like human resources, IT, finance, that kind of thing. It feels like it fits better in a criminal justice oriented entity. Um, and yet there is a racial equity person in AOA. And so it's not a clean fit, but it's, um, I suppose to the second part of the chief's question, it is, um, it makes sense. I mean, am I, am, I, am I chomping at the bit wanting it? Not particularly, but if I'm being honest, it makes sense to, to put it with me. And I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't mind it. And I would be, um, uh, I, I would, do the absolute best we could. But I'm, I'm actually also very intrigued by Jeff's comment about perhaps having a paid position that reports to the panel. That's something I hadn't heard before or considered. And I think that that um, could make a lot of sense. And it also, I think, calls for the sh making sure that this panel is supported with the other administrative and, and other support that it needs. Um, if we're now 
providing staff who are going to be doing that kind of substantive work. So I would also want to couple if if the panel were to make that recommendation, I would want to couple it with another recommendation for whatever additional admin support is needed to um, to support the panel's work. Other places that it might fit, and I'm sure you all have considered this already, um, you know, public safety, sure. Um, ADS, the digital services, which is IT, uh, was floated. I do think, again, that um, the, the technical mechanics might make it fit nicely in, in, in ADS, but substantively, it doesn't necessarily feel like they should be the keepers of, of this. So um, I, I hope that answers questions. It would. Oh, Rebecca. So I was I was um, thrilled to read this first draft, by the way, uh, in terms of the data collection points and appreciate how um, close uh, it, it mapped a lot of our recommendations in terms of the data collection points, um, both on the delinquent side and criminal uh, court system side. So a thank you. I appreciate a lot of hard work going on behind the scenes to all the people there. Um, in terms of that question and hearing your responses, Susanna, I have to throw in my vote with where I'm hearing um, Jeffrey, Sheila, Chief Stevens going. Um, and it really isn't saying anything new in the sense that for me, my sense of our report, number one was independence. And what I'm hearing from you is the pro is centrality, but you yourself are admitting that it's not independent from the governor's office, that the fact that it's within the um, agency administration, uh, which is certainly central in terms of the other government agencies that could be providing, um, doesn't necessarily make it a natural fit. And for me, if we're going to start this right and dream it, and we have been dreaming and RDAP has been the ones to give the legislature and not be burdened by current structures. Uh, I hope that this panel holds true to what we mean by, and this is our moment, what did we mean when we said independent? Because what the current proposal is not just that this is an, an organization within state government, right, because that's A1, but B, that it's very, it's within the governor's office, it is closely tied. And so I would like, if we're gonna keep within state government, I agree with, with what Susanna is saying about IT, digital services is not a great fit. And it, it certainly isn't a match for the substantive importance. I mean, certainly we're gonna need to rely on computer experts for this. Um, but I would suggest that the current options that we, sh that we suggest something beyond what we've been just given, that we create a new body. That's all. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'm really intrigued by what Jeff was saying about, about, um, a position that would liaise with the panel. I guess my question that would attach to that would be to the second point that I would like us to consider this evening with regard to this draft, and that is, are we then saying that we would accept as a body the advisory function to the proposed Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics? I asked that because Chief Stevens pointed out, or Pep, I, you guys are like right on top of each other on my screen, so I'm getting a little, this virtual thing is not working for me. You don't look alike at all, but I'm like confusing you at the moment, which is really interesting. Um, sorry, that's not meant offensively. It's just a computer thing. Um, what you were both, I think, focusing on, this is a volunteer board, Oh my God, we're going to have yet more work. Um, so I guess my question is sort of sort of combining Jeff's suggestion around 
a staff person who would liaise with this board and possibly make that work less onerous. Um, does that then impact the thought of making the RDAP the advisory body that this legislation is talking about? I would say, Aton, only if the necessary resources are provided. I mean, they can't do it without giving the resources necessary to be successful. Uh, I'd also uh, I'd also like to hear Pepper had a, another thought that he was holding. I don't know if you ever expressed that or if you if it has to do with this, Pepper. But um, like I said, the caveat is we get the necessary resources. Got it. Pepper, you you're on you're on the hot seat right now because you were holding back. Uh, the only thing that I was going to say is that uh, for some reason, I feel like when I originally heard of when we started talking to the folks in Connecticut, uh, Mark Pelka and the Office of Management and uh, God, I can't even remember their name, um, but uh, that we used to have something like that in Vermont, actually. Um, and it was specifically designed around health care reform. But there was a team of data analysts and specialists that worked out of the governor's office um, that was specifically advising around changes to our healthcare um, system to, you know, improve access, improve quality, improve, um, well, just the system in general. And uh, that was out of the governor's office. And I and I only the reason why I held back was because I don't know much about what came, what became of that group of policy kind of experts. I, I know that it was housed out of, I think, AOA on the fifth floor, but I just can't remember why they went away, why, why they were created in the first place. Um, but it might be it, in this discussion, it just seemed like it might be relevant, but um, it's kind of a dead end. Cause I don't, <laughs> I don't know where to go with it, but uh I just I seem to remember that there was a and this was under uh, Governor Dean. Um, so it's relatively ancient history. OK. And then she Stevens, you just asked in the chat, since the RDAP falls under the AG, does this new proposed position fall under the support of the AG's office? Good question. Sarah? You're muted. I was just hoping to chime in from the Connecticut perspective, um, just, just to connect some dots. I hope you don't mind as a non panel yeah. But um, in Connecticut, Connecticut does have this advisory board for their work, um, and but it's staffed by the it's staffed by the folks who staff the agency. So, um, and in in the bill that uh, Aton passed along, there are four there are four full time um, staff members in the bill to do the criminal justice research. The executive director, two researchers, and an administrative person. Um, so, if you were emulating the Connecticut model, those people, the I mean, in particular, I would imagine the administrative person and the executive director would be really pushing forward the advisory panel um or you know uh so if that's you all that might lend that person to support your work so it's already in the bill it doesn't have to be extra or if it's a different body i just wanted to note that that um that the kind of the the agency you all are creating or the you know those four staff members that you're suggesting would also support the committee so i think there is kind of more support built in than than what this committee has right now Great. Thank you very much for that. Judge Grierson. So look, I <laughs> I don't know what my ultimate recommendation is, but if the if this panel was going to be the advisory board, we can't do it unless we have some kind of permanent staffing. Um, and, and maybe the answer is, is as as Sarah just indicated, but <clears throat> It just won't work any other way, in, in my view. I mean, we have people that come and go, as 
come and go uh, on this committee. And it, it, for those of you like myself who have been here from the beginning, that first year is not one we would ever want to um, replicate. And, and thanks to your leadership, Aton, we have come a long, long way, but we're still subject to new people coming and going. And, and not that that's, that's necessarily bad, but there's got to be some permanence <laughs> to this. I mean, if you remember, I think when you first came on board and when they created Susanna's position, one of our first reactions was, well, do they still need us? Do they still need the RDAP panel or do we just let Susanna do her thing? And, you know, after talking about it, we decided, no, there's still a role for us. Right. And, and and maybe maybe it does make sense for us to be the advisory panel, but I don't think we can do it the way we're presently structured. I, I think we would need some permanency, a staff person to maintain that continuity that whoever we're reaching out to, um, you know, is getting direction maybe from the panel, but we've got to have, I think that that permanency and maybe it can come from, as Sarah said, what's in this bill. Um, that, that's a big step, I think, for this committee with everything else, this panel or whatever else we've been doing to take on what really is, yeah. becomes a very, very significant role the way I read that that um, that proposed bill. Yeah. So I'm not sure what my final answer is, but without some permanency, staff, administration, whatever you want to call it, I don't think we could. I don't think we could do the job that we would want to do. That's just my thought. Thank you, Monica. Hi, everyone. Um, I, th I think I'm I'm in your back. I'm back. I've been back. I had a weird glitch, came back and just uh, remained uh, hidden here. But I, I've been listening carefully, um, trying to I think I'm in the same sort of position Judge Gerson is in is, um, you know, wanting to think about this. Um, but I, I do agree that um, I wanted to make sure I understood um, maybe what Sarah was saying, because what I'm hearing is that the Bureau itself, a recommendation we're considering is that the Bureau itself be housed with RDAP and that the resources of the Bureau and maybe an additional position to staff RDAP would be necessary and that it would all be housed within RDAP. Because I can't, I can't see as being the advisory panel and not having the bureau at the same time. And I didn't hear a resolution about where the bureau would be. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure one, I wasn't he uh, I was hearing that correctly, or maybe I wasn't hearing it correctly, but wanted to kind of throw that out there that I feel like there that was unclear to me. At present, it said in the bill that the, the bureau is housed in the office of the executive director of racial equity the advisory board is not it's not about it's not housed it's, it's not, not housed. housed it's not housed anywhere so okay and so maybe i misunderstood the question even though i, I promise i've been listening um that the question was should the bu should the bureau be at um in Susanna's office correct and where should the panel be housed? You mean the advisory panel? The advisory the, panel. The correct. proposed advisory the panel. The proposed advisory right. panel. And I thought the question was maybe that the Bureau would not be in Susanna's office. And so yes. my, I guess my question is, do they belong together in the same place? If it comes... If Got RDAP it. is if RDAP is the is the advisory panel, does it make sense for the bureau to be there as well? And I think that's maybe where Sarah was going. Um, okay, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Rebecca. So when I chimed in, I was addressing that first part of the question, and thank you, Monica, for teasing out further because I also feel like I I think I understand your ask on the second part, which is. Um, should our, I'm looking at page seven of the draft. 
Section 5102. And right now it's identifying that members of the panel, A would consist of five members and not, as I understand it, not necessarily uh, include members or someone from the judiciary, someone from DOC, someone from DCF, someone, the community members, right? There's not sort of that. So what I, how I see the shift in the ask now is you're asking us to consider not this currently on the books, but to put RDAP itself as the panel, right? That's and I think, one suggestion, yeah. Okay, and so I think to respond to that, what I like about the current draft, it is definitely something different. Again, it fits the theme of independence, which is really to me at, at the forefront of concern that I want us to hopefully make sure we stay true to. And it follows through with the panel. Um, the way I saw the potential is panel, although I wanted to make sure that if the Human Rights Commissioner wanted to be a member, that that's such a natural fit that that's not written in such a way that it has to exclude um, that person. Uh, same with the Chief Justice. <laughs> uh, if, 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 um, but the point being is that it almost sets up a situation where, I hate the word stakeholders, but for about the key government stakeholders, members on this panel, for instance, are not necessarily included in this, right? And so it struck me and others can chime in how this is similar to other type of um, analysis centers. And I would hope that while the beginning of this draft says that you shall work in collaboration with government agencies, it was sort of written in the context of data collection. Right. But in terms of how to generate the report, I almost like the fact I mean, this panel is comprised of a mix. Um, we never thought about the makeup of the panel uh, or certainly we the legislature <laughs> in the context of how that would play out in a supposed independent data collection body. Right. Um, and how it, if the various interests are appropriately represented by the numbers on the panel. So I would a, say that it is an interesting suggestion. I have to think about it. I don't think it's a natural fit. Aside from the fact of it, if it's going to happen, it should be well funded. We certainly don't have the expertise on this panel necessarily go right into the data analysis. I would certainly hope that by financing it and staffing it well, it would obviously presume the expertise as well to that. Sarah, did you have a comment, Sarah Friedman? Oh, I just put it in chat. I just wanted oh, to okay. respond to Monica. Uh, but that, yeah, you know, as, as much as you all might want to emanate, uh, emulate Connecticut or not, um, you're doing so in some ways and not in others. There, the advisory panel is located and how, you know, is housed within their criminal justice research shop and staffed by those people in that agency. So they're they're all they're one in the same, and this you know, and and the folks that do that staffing um, staff the advisory panel as well. I will also say that you know the panel is definitely not doing any analysis in Connecticut. You know, they they have those researchers on staff who present the analysis to the panel and get their kind of input and take and their recommendations for moving forward or you know like how to operationalize the analysis. Folks on the panel are not doing analysis. That's why there's researchers on staff. And that's an important point. Chief Stevens. Just one other point that we discussed before. If you have uh, uh, Susanna's, um, her, her area, then you have the panel that she works with, right? Because there's another panel of for racial uh, advisory. Then you have us, and then you have a new panel and you know, and then you have the state police doing data collect. So where are all these things? We're adding another panel. Where where do all these things fit? And like you said, we don't want to re do redundancy. Um, so we we just have to think about all these things, I guess, or the legislators do about how do all these pieces fit together so we complement each other and not repeat work or or yeah, I don't know. I'm just I just want to throw that out there because if we're creating a separate panel. All by itself, then that's another entity that's also requesting information from different sources. 
And uh, I think if we're confused, they may be confused about who do they report to? <laughs> you know, where do they put this data? Anyway, just a comment. Okay. Well, let me see. Representative Grad, can I, can I prevail upon you for a moment here? Would it be most useful to you all just for us to make a summary of this conversation and the ways in which the thinking is currently going um, rather than perhaps forcing through a motion and voting it up and down and so on, but just really doing what perhaps the report itself did, which was to really make a bunch of recommendations from a variety of standpoints, including CRG, the National Center on Restorative Justice, the RDAP, et cetera, and allow you all, the lawmakers, to make some decisions perhaps based on further testimony. I, I'm really, I guess I'm asking for a little direction from people who are going to be making some final decisions here. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I'm actually asking my myself the same thing. Um, I, I really appreciate the discussion that you are having now, and so, and and I, I would hope that that plays out, and that we actually, that the legislature isn't, you know, coming down and saying, you know, giving you direction. I think it's, I think it's really important given the the nature of this group and the expertise on this group. Um, to, you know, to come with recommendations or to, you know, um, to continue um, along the path of the report. Uh, you know, certainly, certainly we share your, your goal. Um, and also, for instance, my committee, in terms of many of the things that you're talking about now, what type of entity, where does the entity, where would that entity live, all of that, um, that's really the jurisdiction of government operations. Right. Um, so... So I guess I'm not I'm not giving you a clear answer, but no, I, I really that's do. Fine. Yeah, no, I um, I think it's an, I think it's important for um, for you all to do your work and and um, and it takes time and I know it takes time and um, and I th and I think it's I think it's really important and okay. so thank you. Just want to hear what you might have to say. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Pepper. <clears throat> What, one thing that I was thinking is that, you know, a lot of, well, first of all, the RDAP uh, is set to sunset. I mean, I know that it seems like uh, we get asked to do more and more, uh, which is fine. But one thing that I was thinking is that a lot of our recommendations that we make and a lot of the data analysis that we've been asked to do and a lot of the committees, uh, um, Eitan, that you were asked to testify in front of, are all you know legislative and they're all uh, related to criminal justice reform. I wonder if the best place to house any sort of data analysis group is in the Joint Fiscal Office, um, which which responds to the legislature. And I know that you know when I'm testifying in front of the Judiciary Committees, that often um, there's a crunch when we're look when they're looking considering a bill um, to say, well, what is the independent analysis? We have to rely on the state's attorney's data or the defender general's data. We don't have anyone that can kind of, I mean, there's CRG that has kind of the tableau of data and statistics, but it seems like, you know, maybe this should be a branch of a legislative body that could respond in a nonpartisan way to requests from the judicial, specifically from the judiciary committees. And that that might be, you know, I know that the, I don't know a lot about the Joint Fiscal Office inner workings, but I do know that uh, it's, it's a possibility that th this could be an arm of the Joint Fiscal Office, um, specifically, you know, tailored to judiciary committee. The, ju the two judiciary committees. Oh, I'm liking that, but 
I want to hear, if possible, and it's I'm always putting people on the spot, and I hate doing that, but both Rebecca and Sheila have been making really passionate cases for independence. And you've just suggested something, Pepper, that's kind of a yet another path. And I guess I'd like to hear from either or both of them about what that means in terms of their notions of independence. I mean, it, it may be, I mean, it's a tough one. I'm, I'm feeling like, poor Olivia, welcome Olivia, and I hope you're getting this down because <laughs> I'm imagining there's going to be a long letter going to a bunch of different legislators after this. Rebecca, are you, are, are you, oh, I thought I saw your hand. Never mind. Oh, no, I do see your hand. Well, okay. I, 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 I'll acknowledge you trying to draw me out to make a comment and, and uh, respond to Pepper's suggestion on the Joint Fiscal Office, although I don't have anything to commit to because I, I, like, I like the suggestion in terms of thinking outside of the box. Uh, where is the best place to house it within what is currently structured? I, I don't have that answer or uh, expertise right now, but I would I can quickly come back with some suggestions probably um, when I talk with the Defender General, uh, with right. talk with my other circle of folks to, to consult, um, and happy to, if I can just, you know, a couple days, uh, come back and share with the panel. Let's so my, try that. Cool. Thank you. Sheila. So thanks, Aton. Um, I, I I just I agree with Rebecca and everything that's been said, and I just want to really advocate again for having that independence. Like I really like a lot of things that were suggested tonight, and I don't I don't really know the answer to the joint fiscal. What I do know is that I don't want it to be associated with any um, really the branch or within the government in that way, and I would like it to see it be more independent. I think the suggestions tonight about having the um, advisory and the panel together and what that means and what that looks like. And then um, the references with Connecticut, I think is something that we need to sort out. And I do think it makes sense for that to be together. I think it also makes sense for um, this to be staffed and really well paid and for there to be somebody that um, as a researcher or analysis to be uh, a paid position to be a liaison with this body if we choose to take on this, uh, to be taking on this work. And I'm really, I'm really concerned too of who will represent, uh, be represented on this if um, we do have a lot of people that are connected to the state and it, it seems, or in the field, and it seems as though having those most impacted communities voices at the table and decision making power would be really great so i would like to see that if we are the body to do this that we consider adding more members of the panel panel from the community at large that are directly impacted and not just with the quote unquote um, expertise but maybe with the lived experience or so on um, that we're really talking about and um I'm, I'm just taking note of what Susanna said earlier, which was that I thought it was really funny is that they keep calling it an office and really it's just her. So I just wanted to reiterate that, that um, that's like not okay. And, um, and if they're going to continue to call it an office, then we need to actually staff it so we can do that. And I think that's the pun that's intended here. And I think that if um, we were to keep it in the government somehow, then um, that is going to be uh, needs to be a priority. Thank you, Chief Stevens. Back to you. Yeah, quick question. Going back to what Karen said a long time ago, is about partnerships and who has access to data. Is there any legal authorities that would dictate where this would be housed? Like they have to have some kind of authority to get the data requested or partner because of privacy or other things. Is there anything like that that would dictate um, needing to have that kind of authority, control, power to get the data needed? I just wanted to throw that out there because Karen had mentioned we 
it's not just the data, it's the partnerships between them to try to get the data needed. So I just I just want to make sure we're not overlooking that when we're making decisions, because if they have no authority to get the data request it, then um, the legislators would need to take that into consideration. It would. And one of y'all smart people will have to check me on this. My understanding as looking at the bill as currently written is that one full-time exempt, exempt, exempt executive director of the Bureau, um, who shall be an information technology data analyst, would be that figure? Is that just a bad assumption on my part? Somebody who's smart needs to answer this. That might be the figure, but do they have the authority in the bill to, to, to get data from all the different places that they need. I guess that's what my question is based on what okay. Karen was saying before. Cause like maybe they can't request it from the state police. Maybe they can't request it from these different agencies cause they don't have the legal authority to do so. And there's nothing in the bill stating they might have that. So that was the question is if like the Got AG it. might have a specific authority or maybe this joint commission might have a legal authority but I, I just didn't know if that would dictate this or if it would have to be included in the bill to give them that authority. Well, Chief, I have to go back to the man who drafted this, Eric Fitzger uh, Fitzpatrick, and I'm gonna, I'll put that in him. I'll put that in him. Because he's expecting me to get back to him with everything we've said this evening so he can look at this draft again. So I will put that concern to him. Monica, yo, your hands down again. Okay. Anybody else? David. Yeah, just wanted to, um, I appreciate everybody's brainstorming tonight. I think it's really, it's a lot of really good ideas. And I, I agree with the, underlying what I what I hear is the underlying um, concern that we need both the reality of independence and we need the perception of independence together. Uh, we need it to be independent in fact and, uh, and we need people to trust that it is independent. Um, and you know I was thinking it thinking through some of the structures here one I can see how having the RDAP be a sort of almost a supervisory body for the staff could potentially provide that. My concern though is that that would be such a consuming task, even with staff, that um, I don't know if this body could do that much else. I think our time is, is filled up right now without also supervising a staff doing a serious data collection project. Um, and I don't want our time to be filled up with that because I think we're doing important work and we're becoming increasingly relied on by other areas of state government in a way that I think is to, to generate ideas and think these issues through in a way that I think is productive and, and helpful. Um, I, I do find the um, suggestion of joint fiscal intriguing. I, I, I you know, I'm not a attached to any ideas at this point. I find it intriguing though because it both uh, has the benefit of being a pre-existing structure that also by law is uh, supervised by a, a multi-partisan body, um, which I think would help insulate it from some of the, um, you know, what could be political pressures or, or, or you know, the political winds. Um, and so the sort of staff would be a little bit insulated and then you'd still, in addition to that, have the have the panel, whatever that panel is, ultimately having that panel overseeing it and sort of providing an additional uh, check and uh, and balance on on their work. So anyway, those are just some thoughts, a little bit of concern around uh, making sure this panel is still able to do useful work that's wide ranging and uh, and finding that joint fiscal suggestion intriguing, but I'm not not attached to that. And I want to certainly have the opportunity for folks to check in and, and come back with uh, with further thoughts on that. Anyone else? 
Monica. I, w I was trying to find something online and maybe somebody else on the on the meeting call will remember this, but to Pepper's uh, point about joint fiscal housing this, uh, I think there, I think it's Washington State um, had a similar type of research organization. Karen, is that it? the WISIP group? Remember all that work we did that came out of um, yeah. Pew? And so, you know, they, they were a group that was how sort of um, specifically um, in, you know, a joint fiscal type organization to re respond to legislative requests. They did a, a lot of analysis about the effectiveness of, of programs and to that end they did actually collect a lot of data. Um, and I was trying to um, search for them so I could get a little bit more detail to share with you. But I, I do think that that model is really interesting um, to, to consider. Um, and if I find um, a link to their, or if maybe they're not even in existence anymore, I hope they are, but I, I'll send it to you. Okay. I think they are, Monica, and it's called the Washington State Institute for Public Policy. Right. I knew it was like WISIP, Washington yep, State. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Washington State. <laughs> You know, it's funny what you get when you search for acronyms. Anyway, I will look it up. <laughs> Great. My feeling is, I mean, I know normally at this point in the evening, given that we have like 11 minutes, I nor I'm like pushing and going, let's vote and let's get a resolution. I'm actually not feeling that at the moment. I'm feeling like, well, welcome, Olivia. I can't wait to see your minutes because... <laughs> <laughs> on the basis of them, I feel like I'm going to then speak again with um, Eric Fitzpatrick and um, put these to him. I have no idea, having spoken with him several times, how this is going to evolve, what he's going to do with the conversation that has been had tonight. I don't know what he'll do with these thoughts, how they will influence the draft that we have in front of us. Um, we didn't get that far. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I, so what I'm feeling is I will simply over, look over the minutes and have a discussion with him and go from there. And then probably this will come back to you by way of email. Um, and there won't be, of course, as usual, a great deal of turnaround time on that. Um, but um, these issues obviously are going to be the ones that keep coming back. These are the two main ones. Um, I'm not hearing a lot of discussion about the data points. We had already decided that when we wrote the report. So these are the two biggies. These are the two biggies. Where does it go? Who's the advisory body? And then tangentially, who's supporting the advisory body? Is it enough that it's the people who are mentioned in the draft of the bill, or does it need to be more? It's fairly local here, what we're talking about. I don't think it's huge. Well, it is huge, but it's not, it's not that diffuse. Um, so if anyone else has anything they want to throw in there, that's the path I'm thinking of following and certainly keeping you all in the loop as best I absolutely can. I feel terrible guilt that when Eric Fitzpatrick calls me that I can't get us all immediately on a conference call, but it's not possible. Any further discussion here? Anton, a uh, question. Um, are you looking for authority to make a decision quickly? Because obviously we meet every month. Do they need something before next month? Or you would I'd just call an emergency? Or you would call an emergency meeting? Or you just, uh, we do it by email and then you would make a decision on how we move forward with that? I mean, how are well, you I'll, thinking of structuring this? I. I think we have to take it in smaller steps than that because I'm not in charge of the entire process. Um, I, as far as I have been told, I now need to get back in touch with Eric Fitzpatrick. 
with the discussion that happened here this evening and have a discussion with him. That is as far as I can go at this moment. I'm really not in a position to speak beyond that. If anyone knows more than I do, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Maxine, do you, or sorry, Representative Grad, do you have any sort of sense of, uh, um, I can't remember all the dates for, as far as bills being introduced. Um, and I know crossover is usually right around town meeting week. Um, sometimes it's a little bit later. And But I would also just preface this question with uh, a bill like this. I know it's not, it's a big, it's a big lift, especially when it involves, you know, creating kind of a new department or agency or whatever we want to call it. So, I, you know, but uh, I'm just curious, do you have a timeline with respect to introductions of bills. I forget if there's a date in February um, that we're working up against. Right, right. So, so may I, may I go ahead, um, Eitan? And oh my God, I, please. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so yes, um, I think it's the end of uh, February by when um, bills actually have to be introduced, but at any time there could be a committee bill. And this is this is certainly a longer project, um, you know, and a longer conversation that um, that myself and and um, you know certain committee members and Senator Sears are are committed to. So um, so I'm I'm not con so concerned about crossover or whatever. You know, I think we um, will get the conversation going. Um, I also, as you as you do continue your conversations, um, you know, again, it's a deliberative, it's an iterative process. So don't don't worry about you know getting it all all right or whatever. Um, let's just start the con. Let's start the conversation, and and the more we talk about it together, the more questions will will come up, and. Uh, yeah, and, and I think we'll we'll, you know, just consider all all of these things. Many of the things that you're discussing now are, are things that will be discussed again, and whether it's government operations, House Judiciary, Senate Judiciary. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That lowered my <laughs> blood pressure significantly. <laughs> Well, I'm trying Anyone to figure else. out mine as well. Right? Yep. <laughs> right. Anyone else? We've only really got five minutes. Um, I think, I think, given that, um, I want to address a few other matters. One, the obviously on the agenda, there was a discussion of readings that Julio had sent us, Rebecca had sent us, and by the way, your chair has messed up yet again. There was a reading sent to us by Sheila that your chair managed to screw up and not put in. So he will rectify this, um, and that will go into March. These are discussions concerning civilian oversight models for law enforcement. Again, my Apologies for that. Um, does anyone have any new business at this moment they want to raise? Okay. Seeing no hands. Our next meeting will be, because of the way things work out, the 9th of March of 2021. If something comes up, that is immediate, that needs to happen. I will do the best I can um, to get us together in some form. Uh, thank you all. This was really productive. This was profoundly productive. Again, welcome to you, Olivia. I can't wait to read your minutes. <laughs> so much is going to depend on them. You have no idea how central you have immediately become to this body. Um, and thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you so much for your effort and for your work. Um, and 
I would entertain, I guess, a motion for adjournment. I so move. I so move. Is anyone second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Lovely. Anybody? Oh, Sheila wants to go on. No, never mind. I misread that. All abstaining? We are done. I love you all. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you certainly at the outside in a month. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you.